Welcome to Windtopia. We power the world with wind. We're very pleased to see some of our uh, shareholders here today and some potential shareholders. And uh, I'd like to read to all of you um, a letter from our president and CEO, uh, Wilma McKibben. Dear shareholders, 2045 has been a year of honor, challenge, and collaboration. Windtopia's 50 million wind turbines continue to power the world with zero carbon emissions. As a result, sea level rise across the globe has actually decelerated and environmental scientists unanimously conclude that Windtopia's clean energy is the single largest factor in this change. For this achievement, Windtopia has received the Nobel Peace Prize, the first time this award has ever been awarded to a corporation. We also have learned from adversity. Our safeguards against environmental terrorism are ever strengthened after the Bay Area incident. Strategic adjustments are continuously made in the high-risk zones. More details of this can be found in the security section of our report. Wintopia also continues to join the medical community in battling avian flu. Following the request of the World Health Organization, we have modified our turbine blades to be even more effective at terminating airborne carriers. Due to this updated change, the dangerous avian population has been almost entirely eradicated. To the communities we serve, we renew our vow to stay connected. To the investors who have placed their trust in us, I am glad to report that our profits continue to break records. This year's annual report reflects our commitment to these relationships day after day, so long as the wind shall blow. Again, from Wilma McKibben, our president and CEO. I know a lot of you must have questions about how things are progressing and uh, the continued success of our company, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them, Mark and I, so uh, I'd like to open up to questions. Anyone? Uh, would like to ask anything we're here to answer. We, uh, we encourage that. We, we encourage people to set up their own um, source of energy because our, um, this, we are going in the direction of a distributed power distribution system. Then this is particularly important after our grid, the, the legacy system was attacked uh, 2038 when uh, ISIS uh, infiltrated our grid and caused huge blackout. Um, so actually before that, Wintopia has a foresight that we should uh, revolutionize, overhaul our grid system because the grid system has been there for decades and it's a very vulnerable system. People have been trying to hack into it to, to cause major havoc. Uh, but after that event, the general public finally realized the importance of distributing the power source. That's why our turbines, the wind farms, are mostly uh, right around the urban area. Just look around in Houston, we have 2,000 turbines everywhere. So that is to eliminate the vulnerability of the grid system. So in continuation of that kind of development, we also 
like to promote every household to win to own a turbine or two depends on how back how large your backyard is that you can produce power for yourself and again we're it really continues our our themes of clean and affordable energy for everyone and kind of this theme of independence as well so the same as municipalities now can be independent with their energy source again without this dependence on the grid individuals as well especially in rural areas it's, it's a viable option to own your own turbine Yes, well, you may remember it's been some decades ago now, there was some prob problems with avian flu, and this was a very a severe virus that was transmitted through the avian population, birds. Uh, originally, we'd had some issues, uh, some feedback from uh, wildlife conservationists about that, how the turbines could actually hurt the bird. Uh, and then we realized that that wasn't such a bad thing after all. And so we've actually redesigned the turbine so it actually is more affected, effective at eliminating the avian population. And because of that, we have, again, we've won awards from the World Health Organization, and we've almost eradicated the carrier of avian flu. And I'd like to invite everyone of you, the young generation probably haven't seen a bird in your lifetime. Uh, we do have a... Uh, a preservation of the, all the species of birds in our, one of our research facility in Montana. And uh, where you can see probably about, not all of them, 50% of the bird species that existed uh, 30 years ago. Um, and you rest assured, those birds do not carry avian flu virus. So it's safe to tour the place. You know, if you, your parents have concern, talk to us, you know, it's uh, your chance to see something that you don't see in the wilderness now. Like we said, research has shown in the last 20 years, we've really reversed that process uh, completely. Uh, there's no longer a threat of global warming. A lot of the environmental concerns that we thought that this generation would have to be facing has now been eradicated or you know, reversed due to the efficiency of this energy source and no longer using some of the more traditional coal burning uh, and, and more polluting energy sources, atomic energy, those kind of things, which had you know, devastating environmental consequences. And allow me to add that the, there are many different kinds of, of, of global warming gas and CO2 is the major one. And CO2 um, stay there for a long time. So even though we have been using clean energy for, for a few decades, the, the slowing trend is only happening slowly. So when Alta mentioned decelerating, it's actually saying that the trend has been putting on a break. So it's happening a lot slower. And we, we foresee that in half a century, the trend is going to reverse. Well, there has been, again, some great uh, technological advances in the battery source that actually stores this energy. And again, because of the, the uh, volume of turbines we have, that's been really helpful in kind of distributing. And um, we've also uh, increased the efficiency of these turbines. So there's less resistance in the motor. The, the blades actually spin a lot easier than some of the earlier models. So even with this, a, a smaller amount of wind, there still is an efficient amount of energy produced. Right. And so in detail, um, the 50 million term turbine in the whole world now, you can actually think about about half of them, 25 million of them are actually turning at this moment. So that's why we want 50 million. So it's a backup system. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, Elton mentioned the battery. We also, we not just battery, we're also using another kind of storage device, which is um, flywheel. So flywheel, every, under every Wintopia wind farm, there's a farm of white flywheel, but you don't see them because they are underground. So these flywheel are gigantic turning cylinders, and they are uh, magnetically elevate, elevated, so they do not touch any part, and the, the chamber that seals it is vacuum. So what it does is it has coil around it, when there's plenty of energy from the wind, they charge them. And when they are charged, the wind turbine accelerate to up to 30,000 uh, uh, RPM, which is a tremendous amount of energy in there. And when the wind doesn't blow, 
then it starts to release the energy. So it's a, it's a system that overcomes the, the, the inherent problem of intermittent nature of wind, wind energy. And although there are some uh, irregularities in wind flow, like y you so astutely pointed out, again, compared to fossil fuels, which had a finite amount, you know, and it was going to run out and basically has now, right. the wind, if, if it's a little less windy today, tomorrow has a good chance of being more windy. Pretty good. I mean, you know, we're talking aerodynamic strength, uh, aerotechnology strength, materials, and again, we're, Mark's going to show us in a little bit, we're actually uh, exploring some new materials as well. So, so far we've been pretty lucky. Our right. biggest threat has been environmental terrorists more than natural uh, causes. Right. And our turbines, uh, each one of them is independent, independently controlled by a computer that adjusts to the, the uh, environmental you know, climate factor. So in adverse situation like hurricane, uh, our newest design will actually fold the, the blades and then attach to the column to minimize the area that's taking the wind. So well, other than wind, what about earthquakes? They, they are very good in resisting earthquakes, much better than buildings, because these are a very sort of minimalistic structure. And you know, California was one of the first states to really embrace uh, wind energy as well. And you know, right. they have such a high uh, history of, of earthquakes and we've stood the test of time very well there. When you look at uh, historically what's happened with earthquakes, for example, with nuclear reactors, there is much greater risk because of all the, you know, the toxic chemicals, the environmental impact of these was much greater risk. So again, the turbines are really, um, it's a win-win situation when it comes to that, even though they, they certainly Every man-made object is at risk of, of some kind of damage from nature, but uh, in compared to like, you know, what could happen in the case of a tsunami or an earthquake to a nuclear reactor, your, your outcome is much better with wind, with wind power. I do have yeah, let me, let a me uh, stand. little bit of sneak preview of our new engineering ingenuity, introducing SPIDER. This is a system of uh, 3D printing for turbine. So, you're actually looking at a printer, but this printer prints steel. And this particular component is in charge of producing the column of the wind turbine. And why do we need to print this thing on site? Because size matters for turbine. The bigger, the better. It's not because we couldn't build bigger turbine, but the problem is transportation. You see, you cannot carry a column as big as this half of this building on the freeway. So what do we do? We make them on site. So this is a printer. And if you look at the top one, it has a, a circular track in the middle. That little cube is a print head. And this diagonal line is another track. So it prints by circling around and it ejects steel to a pre-made foundation for the turbine. So this is how it's made. So with a drone, this is carried to the top of a foundation. And this start printing. And this steel, rod of steel, is actually the ink. It sends in there, it's melted with laser technology. Then it starts forming this cylindrical shape in a spiral. And as it moves up, the legs grabs onto the column and moves up slowly as they print. And the shape is tapered with however we program it. And at the end, it finished printing, it climbs down by itself. Drone comes, pick it up, move it to the next foundation. So with this, we can build turbines three, four times bigger than before. At you know, 2016, the maximum capacity of a turbine is about seven megabyte. And that kind of turbine takes all kinds of heavy equipment you can think of to build. With this, we can produce 20 mega uh, watts capacity turbine in a matter of a month. Very, very fast production. So this is the future. And I'd like to add, I mean, we all have 3D printers at home now. It's a very common thing, but this, this is an advancement and kind of a technological breakthrough that we're using it in this way. 
And not only is it building higher columns, but transportation, like Mark was saying, so we've cut out our transportation fee uh, expenses, so it's actually producing a more affordable one. And location. Anywhere our drone can fly, we can go in and put up a turbine. Right. And, you know, I'm happy to see a familiar face, Javier uh, Loaiza, actually is behind. He is the uh, chief of engineering department at Wintopia. And this is his design. So, good job. <laughs> okay. Um, so, how do you like Wintopia? Scary. Scary. I have bird feeders at home. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we can talk a little bit more about this, but what I'm creating is an imperfect utopia. I, I don't ever believe that we will, human race will achieve a utopia. Because our nature, we always have some dark side. You know, you, you see the positive side of this, right? No global warming, that's, yay, that's great. But there are other problems. Propaganda, you know, monopoly, greed, Right, so, so I created Wintopia to make people think about this, right? If now the environmentalists say, hey, we should do this, we should do that. So, okay, there you go. You're in charge. What will happen? Remember the saying, absolute power, you know, corrupts. Absolutely. So even if the environmentalist is in charge and then environmentalist is the capitalist, what will happen? So those are the things I like everyone to think about. All right, so let me talk a little bit about this. So how did I came to create Wintopia and the Next Door Show, which is renewed? Um, so this is how I started. That image got me hooked. I was driving uh, in uh, Arizona, and I saw this like a mirage at the horizon. I pull off the car, the, uh, pull off the freeway, park the car and photograph it. And I was very scared because it feels very strange. It, it, I didn't see anybody there. It's just, you know, a running um, coal power generator and churning out tons of smoke. So I photograph it and I came home and I researched about it, and I realized that there has been a, a project to research the, the harm this one produced. And they actually estimate about 13 people died every year from the pollution from this. So, so this is the beginning, you know. And I have to admit, I thought this is beautiful. It's horrible and beautiful. So. It's not just my interest for environment, it's also my interest as an artist, because this is just looks beautiful. Does anybody here agree with me? You think this looks beautiful? Yeah? The rest of you, any one of you think this looks so ugly? If you don't think about what's behind it, right? So it, it is aesthetically quite stunning. So these are the other things I did at that time. This is the world's largest coal power plant. It generates 20% of whole Taiwan's energy consumption. So this one is 5,000, 6,000 megawatts. Humongous. Okay, so I um, went to UH to study art. And when I showed this to a professor, he said, oh yeah, this is nice. Where did you get your inference from? I said, hmm, I don't think I have an inference. Okay, and Dr. Jacobs happened to be an art historian, and he just blatantly said, that's not going to work. So the very next semester, I took his class and I learned about what other photographers are doing. And then I realized this thing called inference is very important for anybody engaging in art, right? We need to stand on the sh shoulders of the giants. So who's my giant? Edward Batinsky is the first one. And this, I just showed a couple of his work. This is a phoenix. You see that? That line in the middle is not Photoshop. It's a physical line at the boundary of phoenix. Phoenix is the, the most environmentally incorrect city 
in the world. If you don't, if you don't eat, you know, put water in that right side, everything should be like on the left side. It's a desert. Okay? So this is how we mess up the environment. We build a city in a place that sh really shouldn't be there. And this is another very famous work of his. It's called Oil Field. He had a, a lot of this. He basically pictures a pretty horrendous sight of what we have done to the environment. Like Chris mentioned earlier, the kind of feel bad environmental art. And Chris Jordan. And this is um, one of his very famous uh, series from shot in Midway Island. This uh, albatross, this birds, could not distinguish the difference between plastic and food, so they ate them, then they die of starvation. And this is their caucus. And this is a pile of cell phone. Chris Jordan is very good in repetition. So this is a whole thousand of cell phone in one shot. Very powerful and very impactful. OK, but these are all making you feel bad images, right? It's my, not my nature to make people feel bad. Actually, I want to be a comedian. I always want to be a comedian. So one day when I went to a conference, I learned about Juan Fontubeta. And he's actually very funny. He is a photographer with sense of humor. So this is a series of his work. And he addressed reality. So he pretends something to be real. Like this series is called The, the Journey of Soyuz, the, the uh, Russian space program. And he's, he maintains that actually they use, they should be six space heroes instead of five. So the picture above is a real one, and the additional cosmonaut is actually posed by himself. So he said that's a real photo, that's a fake photo. Of course, the reality is the opposite. So he, you know, as a boy, he loves space, and that's he in the military, and this is a blast off, and that's the cosmonaut and who shoots him. And this is a face space walk with a dog, who's, who's also in space suit. But eventually, there was a more function, and he was lost in space forever. And the Soviet Union loves to cover up, right? So they changed that photo, that photo into this photo. So this story is very funny, right? Um, and actually, a TV station mistook this as real and reported it without verifying it. So, you know, I love his sense of humor. <clears throat> so he did this, and he also did this. This is called fauna. And he created a bunch of non-existing animals, like that baboon with four legs. And remember, this is before Photoshop, so this was mainly dark room. So he addressed reality, and he poked fun at, at that. And he purposely made this, all the stand, this are on purpose. It makes it look like a, a documentation came from the field. So I thought, hey, that's great. Why can I use that to address my environmental concerns? So I want to make it funny. And after that, I also learned Cristina de Midel. Uh, he and Juan are both Spanish, so maybe there's better sense of humor from that, you know, group of people. So what she did most famously is this thing called Afronaut. Now Zambia, in the 50s, one science teacher proposed this idea that we should go to the space too. So he, he uh, planned a space program, which didn't take, even take off. But Cristina de Midel thought that was such an interesting story. So he reenacted what would have happened if it was successful. So the, 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 the ball is actually a street lamp. And she used, she used a lot of African color and, and you know, uh, style in the space suit. So things like that. So both of them address the reality, the, the issue of reality. So I thought, hey, I can do that. So I come back and I created Wintopia. All right. So, let me see what's. 
OK. So what is Wintopia? You probably have some idea already. It's art. It's a work of activism. It's a prediction of what's probably going to happen. It's a fiction. And it's an experience for you to be immersed. And it's also a performance. And it's an ongoing story. The plan is going to I keep, keep it 30 years ahead of today.